everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is our panel series, and today we're going to be talking about HIE and vision impairment. I have three awesome parents from our Hope for HIE community here to share their stories and share how they've been navigating vision impairment and HIE with their child. So I'll go ahead and let them introduce themselves, and then we'll get started. Hi, my name is Stephanie, and my son Jake is three, and he has CVI and severe HIE. And we've been navigating this for the last three years, and it's been an adventure. Hi, I'm Allison. Um, my son is Rob. He's six. Um, we live just north of Boston, and I'm a peer support mentor for Hope for HIE. Hi, I'm Danielle, and my son Marty is seven years old, and he has severe HIE and CVI. We have been um, a part of you know HIE group since the beginning, so for seven years, uh, and um, he's had CVI for um, five of those seven years. So we are um, just navigating this road, and I'm happy to be a part of this panel. Thank you for sharing. We're so excited and just your journey. So we talked about starting with um, there are multiple vision impairments can occur. Today we're going to focus a lot on CVI, which is cortical visual impairment, and a couple other impairments. So starting with CVI, the first thing that we want to discuss is just the range of vision impairment with kids with HIE. So if y'all want to share a little bit about your experience, that'd be great. For our son, um, he was diagnosed pretty young, about three months old with, with CVI, um, and he has pretty significant issues. Um, he, he can see, but he does have low vision as well. So um, we kind of have to deal with both the low vision and the CVI issues at the same time. So we use a lot of uh, TVIs, which are uh, teachers of the visually impaired, to help out our son. Um, so my son, Rob, was diagnosed with CVI. Um, I think he was about nine months old. Um, he was diagnosed by his ophthalmologist and his neurologist. And he is also seen at the low vision clinic um, at our local school for the blind as well. He also has um, an astigmatism. So he utilizes glasses for the astigmatism. My son, Marty, he uh, was diagnosed with CVI at two years old, and um, we were diagnosed by his neurologist, um, neuro-ophthalmologist and ophthalmologist, and um, we became um, patients of a low vision specialist at Children's of Alabama, and that's been the most helpful for us. Uh, we were able to be a part of um, AIBD. BT, excuse me, our local um, low vision and school for the blind for a short while, um, but we are our most um, impactful uh, resource has been the low vision specialist at Children's of Alabama. Thank you all for sharing. The next thing we're going to talk a little bit about is just the different providers that are involved when your child has a diagnosis of CVI. So if y'all want to just share about the specialist that you see and kind of how they're able to help your child, that would be great. So we see an ophthalmologist and he does the diagnostics for the most part. And then we also see a, a low vision specialist, a, a pediatric optometrist um, who also has some specialty in low vision and in CVI. And so she does um, other testing for us to kind of figure out how he's seeing and how his brain is receiving information. So Rob um, is seen by an ophthalmologist um, who does his like yearly check-ins and, you know, the testing kind of like how we do when we go and read the letters, but instead they like use cards to test his vision. Um, and then he is seen by the low vision clinic at Perkins. So that um, ophthalmologist focuses on, you know, how he's seeing range of field. So Robert has lower field loss. So he uh, can't see really anything lower than his chin, like probably from about here down. So that's, they really helped us figure that out and figure out what resources and ways to present things to him to make it best visually. 
And Marty is seen by a neuro-ophthalmologist and a low vision specialist. And uh, the, the neuro-ophthalmologist um, is twofold. We're able to um, just get his vision checked uh, as an optometrist would do. So we're able to just the health of his eyes and, and what that looks like. We do have some nearsightedness as well, um, but it's, it's pretty minor um, compared to a CVI. So we focus mainly on a CVI. Um, with the uh, low vision specialist, they're the ones that kind of definitely manage just the care of what his brain can see and how to best optimize his vision. Uh, so we, along with other diagnoses we have, um, he's got a very low tone and, and low mobility. So uh, along with having the, um, the limitation of what his brain can, can, can understand when he sees, which he can see, it just ebbs and flows from time to time. Um, along with being able to determine what he, what his brain is understanding, we also need to be able to figure out how to best uh, have him see in his vision field based off of his abilities. So the low vision specialist has been able to really help us to navigate that as well, like how to place things around uh, so that he is able to, to see and optimize the vision that we do have. And thank you. I also mentioned, sorry, that uh, Robert also sees a teacher of the visually impaired at school through our local school district. Okay, great. Um, some of the other things we want to talk about for a minute is just the resources available to you for navigating CVI with your children with Hope for HIE. So one of the great resources that we have as a part of the HIE community is our child life specialist, Annie. She's fantastic. And on our website, hie.support, you can connect directly with her. Um, and basically, she can help you with navigating CVI and any other diagnoses your child may have, and just adapting your environment to help your child with their vision needs. She's also a part of the Child Life on Call app that also has information as well just about how to navigate, you know, different diagnoses and CVI and your environment. The next thing we want to talk about is just navigating the hospital setting. So if y'all could just share a little bit about how CVI impacts your hospital stays and what you do and who you reach out to when you're there at the hospital to help make that a good experience for your family. Sure. With Jake, he gets very anxious when he's in new settings um, because he can't see very well and things seem to be coming at him from all directions. So we've talked a lot with our hospital staff and each time we go in, that he can't see very well. So we wanna make sure that they are talking to him through anything that they do before they touch him, before they do something so that they um, realize that his vision impairment is really important um, to address to kind of keep his anxiety level down. As Stephanie said, we also go through with the providers to, you know, have them walk through and talk to Robert about everything they're going to do, whether it's a blood draw or a test or an, even a nebulizer treatment, just kind of talking him through it and saying, you know, we're going to put this mask on your face now, or we're going to have to take some blood. We're going to use your left arm and using um, like a lot of tactile like letting them hold the syringe or, you know, trying to just incorporate things that they're gonna be doing into his sensory fields. Um, we also contact the child life specialist in the hospital and they usually uh, put a sign above his bed that will say like, I best respond this way. If I look this way, I'm probably angry. Or, you know, if I'm sleeping, please leave me alone if possible. You know, just those little things that and it's from the hospital laminated, it goes right above his bed. So it kind of completes that care circle between the providers and what rubs actually needs. For Marty, when we're in the hospital, um, he is thankfully his, uh, he's very laid back in his, he doesn't experience much, much anxiety, again, very thankfully. Um, so what works best for us is just making sure that we uh, communicate with the staff that just to come into his visual field, whichever way his direction, his head is, his position, he just come into his visual field. And it actually does help for us um, to have them definitely talk to him and do like gentle touching just to confirm that they are there and he responds really well to that. Thank you for sharing that everyone. Now we want to talk a little bit about day-to-day -day life with CVI, things like how you've adjusted in your home to help your child navigate, 
with their vision impairment, things with lighting, all of those things. So what in the day to day, you know, helps you all to navigate with CVI and your child? For us, we um, just try to keep the the background room um, kind of quiet. So, you know, fewer colors, things like that, so that when we're presenting things to him, he can see them a little bit better than if there was a lot of stuff going on. So we don't have a lot of, of like pictures on the walls or things like that. Our walls are painted gray. Um, so there's a, a higher contrast, I guess, when we present toys and things to him because he can see those a little bit better. Um, also, it's it's very uncluttered um, just to kind of help him be able to focus on the little things instead of having so much in front of him. Um, so that's kind of what we do at home uh, when we're, you know, a little bit more out and about. We try to, you know, let him know what's going on. So at home, we definitely keep the lights a lot dimmer, um, especially in Robert's room, where that's kind of where I struggle because I like the house nice and bright and he does not. So it's always a battle. Um, and as Stephanie said, we try to keep the house kind of more uncluttered, especially if it's in a space that he's going to be actively working in. Um, we also have used a like black felt, um, almost sheet that we hang up, um, to kind of give him that, you know, contrast when we're presenting materials to him, or just even if he's seeming overwhelmed, sometimes taking out all the other clutter in the house visually and even auditory as well you know if it's too stimulating visually and auditory kind of try to get rid of one or both if we can to help adapt his environment and as Stephanie said as well when we're out just talking to him telling him where where we are what we're doing where we're going um, we also noticed recently that if he wears a hat while we're out it sometimes helps because it will help block out some of the visual clutter um, he loves to stare at the sun and all the lights so sometimes putting that hat on will help keep him focused they started using it as a tool in school as well with marty at home we it, it's a lot of the same um as the other ladies uh, do for their children we uh, definitely we just try to make the environment as neutral and uh, uncluttered as possible uh, just being able to have like a darker background patterns like in, say in pillows or or uh, couches or curtains, uh, just more muted, more simple so that it doesn't confuse or clutter his, his mind when he's trying to see. I'm um, having the darker background, like we too have like black uh, poster board or black fabric that we hang when we're wanting to really help him work on his vision and be able to focus on the items in front of him. Um, also with lights, he loves to stare at any light. <laughs> so we definitely try to position him so that he's not um, able to just gravitate to that light and, and is able to focus focus on other things. And also while we're out, we, we do a lot of the same thing. Again, that sunshades, sunglasses, hats are great because it does um, help him to uh, not look at the sun so much and be able to focus on what's going on around him. And we do tell him like, do you see these lights or, you know, explain what's going on around him to help uh, get him focused to be able to try and, and tr try and see and understand. That's all great information. Thank you all for sharing about that. I know that's going to help a lot of families. The last thing we want to talk about as far as like um, CVI specifically, and we are a worldwide organization. So I run on this panel right now is based in the U.S., but we do want to share a little bit about, you know, early intervention in school age, as we know, you know, when you enter into school vision and things like that are definitely something to navigate. So we wanted to talk a little bit about, obviously, depending on where you live, your school, public, private, homeschool, that will determine your eligibility or what resources are in your area. But if our panel could just share of some of the resources that you've utilized or that you know that other families have found helpful, I think that would be great too. We used First Steps Early Intervention, we're in Missouri. And with that, um, we were able to get a TVI um, instructor through Delta Gamma Center. And she followed us for the full three years that our son was in um, early intervention services. We just transitioned to the school district. So um, we have a TVI, um, a teacher for the visually impaired um, instructor through the school district who is consulting with our uh, PT and OT 
our speech therapist, and our early childhood special education teacher. Um, our child is um, homebound educated, um, but still part of the public school. So they didn't have medical classrooms in our, our school district. So we opted for homebound services instead of a regular classroom. So Rob goes to our pub local public school. He's in first grade. Um, he's been going there since preschool, which I don't know if we can truly count that because that was 2020. <laughs> but he has a teacher of the visually impaired that he is seen by um, at twice a week for 30 minutes. And then he is. The teacher of the visually impaired also consults in the classroom as well. Um, she has designated time that she goes in and helps adapt, you know, different material or just kind of help set up the classroom if, you know, she doesn't feel that, you know, it could be better in some way for his vision. Um, he is not the only kid in his class with CVI, so they are very well versed, luckily, Um and then we also did had early intervention. We had the teacher of visually impaired through there that followed him for the first three years. Um, fortunately, we live semi close to Perkins School of the Blind. So we also attended an infant toddler group there um, for two years, which was really nice. He got it was almost like a preschool setting with uh, two teachers of the visually impaired and volunteers. And he got to go for a few hours a week. Um, and then they kind of helped give us different online resources or, you know, like different YouTube channels we've tried or, um, you know, CBI Scotland, just a few, there's a, a whole lot of websites out there that can help with resources. And Marty, we um, were in early, in early intervention. So we were able to utilize, um, the resources through there. We, with us getting our diagnosis later um, at two years old, um, and of course you age out of early intervention at three. So we had a short period of time where we were able to utilize that resource, but we were through them able to be connected to a teacher of the visually impaired through the Alabama Institute for the Deaf and Blind. So that was great to have that um, resource for that time. After that, we are actually homes, a homeschool uh, family. So a lot of our resources come from our low vision specialist, actually also as well as our um, speech pathologist or speech therapist. So we work a lot on his vision in therapy. We co-treat with um, his occupational therapist and we work a lot on his vision um, there on a, on a biweekly basis. And then we also, with our low vision specialist, get specific um, CVI tips and tricks and things like that that we can use. Um, as Allison mentioned, there are tons of um, websites and resources online. So we've gotten a lot of um, recommendations on things we can do and, and pull from online and, and different things to help with that. So that's been our journey. And so far, it's been very helpful. Great. Thank you guys so much for sharing. Um, the next thing we want to talk about for just a little bit is strabismus, nystagmus, and low vision. So if the panel just wants to share on your experience with things such as patching, surgery, glasses, um, and then any diagnoses or, you know, any kind of treatments or kind of how you've navigated any of those other vision impairments. Sure. Jake had strabismus and nystagmus. Um, we had surgery when he was about one um, for both the strabismus and to help with the, the nystagmus a little bit. Um, and that was very successful. Um, they are looking, you know, following him to make sure that the, his eyes don't continue to turn. Um, they may have to do a second surgery to straighten them again if they do continue to turn. Um, he also has low vision. He's very farsighted and has a high astigmatism. <clears throat> we tried to do glasses and he was uh, very non-compliant. So as a um, daughter of an optometrist, my dad actually was able to order him contact lenses. So our three-year-old wears contact lenses every day, and that seems to help him at least be able to see clearly the things that he can see. Um, so that helps him with his, um, you know, being able to see and understand what's around him. So Rob has um, nystagmus as well as astigmatism on top of his CVI. Um, and then he, I would consider him to have low vision as well, um, based on his acuity scores. He is registered as legally blind. Um, 
So with the nystagmus, we haven't really done a whole lot to help because it's very intermittent and it doesn't stick around for too long. Um, for his astigmatism, he does wear glasses. Um, we love the glasses he has. We, we've had them for three years now. They fit great. <laughs> I know that's always a issue in when people try to find glasses what fit and what that so the kids will actually wear them and so we've had luck with the tomato glasses is the brand that we use um and then we also add it in transition lenses for him so when we go outside he has the automatic sunglasses on to help with you know the light staring and just kind of to protect his eyes as a whole he and it kind of helps keep him from getting too overwhelmed as well when with the brightness and transitioning from inside to outside, it just gives a nice kind of adjustment period for him, but he tolerates them great, thankfully. Um, and he, it, it seems to work well from what we can tell, I guess, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's always a guessing game. And for Marty, we uh, struggle with both nystagmus and strabismus, and um, we do have some low vision as well. And for us, we did uh, try glasses actually as a part of a study with our low vision specialist to see, they were doing a study um, to see what may work to help with CVI. And he too <laughs> was quite non-compliant. So that did not last long, but uh, because of his visual field um, with our other diagnosis, diagnoses, it was okay. We were able to stay close and, and all that too to work on his vision. Um, for the nystagmus, it is the same and that it's not a constant. Um, so we don't do anything to treat it. It's more intermittent and more kind of triggered by events um, such as a uh, quick movement. Um, he also has a seizure disorder, so that can trigger that as well. Um, so ours is just, um, we work through um, the moment really, if you, so to speak. For strabismus, ours is also interesting at uh, this kind of the same um he's got his muscle uh, tone in his eye is low based off of other diagnoses and when he's tired it actually gets worse so it kind of it it it, it shows more then so we just kind of work around that as well so again we haven't done anything um, medically intervention wise to treat both of those just because of his case and um for the low vision Again, his um, nearsightedness is not pronounced. So um, based off of his life, we're able to accommodate that and just kind of keep his vision field shorter, closer to him. And so far that has worked well for us. Of course, we're watching it to see if we may need glasses again in the future, but so far <laughs> things are going well. <laughs> Thank you all so much for sharing that. The last part um, I just wanna talk about a little bit is we touched on it for, a brief minute, but just any other tips or tricks or things that you found very helpful with navigating when you're not at home. So if you're going to events or if you're traveling or anything that may be new to your child or something that, you know, they might need a little bit of extra support with, what do you find are some helpful things or what have worked well for you and your families? Um, I found making sure we have the, um, the, the screen or cover for his uh, wheelchair stroller so that we can put that over the top, that that little shade, that helps a little bit. Um, staying close to him so that I can tell him that I'm there, especially when I can see his eyes getting really wide with that anxiety. Um, putting my hand on his, on his arm just to kind of remind him that, you know, he's not by himself in that scary world. Um, those are all big things that help him out. Um, we've, we've also experimented a little bit with headphones to kind of reduce the, the loud noises that, you know, also come about with everything else. So. So we do very similar things when we go out. Um, I, like I had mentioned before the you know, we utilize a hat to help block out like sunlight and his sunglasses. Uh, we have used a uh, umbrella on his wheelchair. We don't have a shade cover, but we've, um, hooked up an umbrella to his wheelchair to help block out some extra noise. Um, we also have utilized headphones as well. Um, sometimes, you know, getting rid of the extra noises that we don't need can help simplify the environment a little bit better for him. And even sometimes just like a weighted blanket, if we, if it's going to be like a long trip for the car, um, just give him some grounding. He loves, you know, all big movements. So if he's having a hard time trying to like find a more quiet corner and maybe do some spinning or I'll take him out of his wheelchair and do some like bouncing on my leg. If, 
I can still, um, but just trying to give him the sensory input that he needs at that time to kind of work through whatever the situation is that we are in. And we're the same. We do similar things. Uh, the sunshade um, on his wheelchairs and stroller are key for us, as well as sunglasses. Um, and we're able to and have, and we're able to get him to wear one. All of that helps with kind of blocking out again uh, the busyness of the visual field. And as far as helping him to be able to focus on what he's seeing, um, we do a lot of talking to him and pointing out what is around him. Uh, physical touch helps a lot. That's if, for grounding for him. That's a big thing for grounding as well as um, kind of getting him out of the wheelchair sometimes and just kind of getting him close and, and talking to him closer to his ear and helping him focus that way. Um, and we also do things like wrap up in blankets or use weighted blankets because that helps him as well. Just kind of the grounding and feeling safe and secure and able to block out um, the distraction and any anxiety that he's having. Thank you so much. Um, before we close, I just wanted to also share and have y'all talk a little bit about Hope for HIE does have an Amazon storefront and it has different toys and books and things. So if y'all could just share a little bit about different, you know, like things like tactile toys and books, textures and books, high contrast toys, and just things like how you utilize those in your home and with your child. We use a lot of the um, never touch a books that have the, um, they're kind of like rubber texture areas on the pictures. He loves those to reach out and touch them. Um, so that kind of helps him focus. We also like um, toys that have lights um, that, you know, even if they blink or, you know, even solid colored lights will a lot of times attract his attention. So we use those quite a bit, but those tactile um, books and things are probably his favorites. We utilize a lot of those books as well. And the not my or never touch books there, you know, they have the not my dog and it's all different like furry textures or the not my, I think it's the fire engine one. And it has like the shininess and all that. Um, when Rob was little, his favorite toy was a slinky with a flashlight down the middle of it. Um, our TVI kind of helped discover that. But if you put it against a dark background and you bounce the slinky, it, it kind of radiates the light in fun ways. So it always got his attention. That was the first thing he ever reached out for was a slinky with a flashlight. But we also do utilize a lot of toys with lights, um, a lot of sound. He's very auditory driven. So, so I know some kids, the auditory piece can be too much with the vision but for him it really helps him kind of figure out where it is that he's supposed to be looking and what toy it is um when he was younger as well we use i believe it's um is it a little i said i can't remember the name but i, I know it's on the amazon storefront for hope for hie it's a little rattle that has the head um is red it lights up and then the bottom also has a mirror on it and it's very light and very easy to hold on to so that was always a favorite and then right now now that he's six his favorite is um a electronic drum pad it doesn't light up but it makes lots of noise and he thinks it's hilarious Allison I got that rattle right after we talked last time and Jake <laughs> loves it same same here <laughs> <laughs> uh for Marty um lights are a big thing for him. So we do Christmas lights all year round. <laughs> we do white lights and we do the colored lights. And that's always a great, um, a great item for him to, he loves to, to look at them. And the fact that we, we love lights and we love things that flash, we, we have toys with lights and we have like books with lights, all of that. Um, but for him, actually the flashing, um, it doesn't trigger anything negative, but he's able to focus more on either no flashing or less busy moving lights. If that makes sense, it gives him time to actually focus and see and be able to concentrate more on it. So we, things that have either along with Christmas lights, he likes things that have like a larger surface of the light um, versus like small spots. And we do well with um, bright colors. So red and yellow, purple, green. Um, he loves those gold, silver, all of those are his favorite colors. And he's able to draw um, his attention to that better. And um, auditory actually really helps as well. He loves music. So we've got that going 
the majority of the time and it actually helps them to be able to focus and, and work on things. So we classical is huge in our home uh, or something that's kind of more soothing and less busy when he's working on his vision. Um, so we've got that going and that helps him to be able to concentrate as well. So lights and, <laughs> and the auditory, the music goes well together for us. Thank you guys so much for sharing. And I just want to thank all three of you for joining us today and for sharing about your experience with HIE and different vision impairments. And I just want to encourage everyone to please check out the other videos on our YouTube channel. And also, if you need any support, please go to hie.support and you can see all of the support groups, social work, child life, and all the different services and resources that we have here at Hope for HIE. So thank you, everyone.